This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Emma Keeling, looking at the impact antivirals will have as we learn to live with COVID-19. And I'm Neil Cairns in London, asking, what is time and how do we measure it? Twenty twenty one was yet another exhausting and often tragic year for those on the front line against COVID. But in the lead up to the new year, there was some good news in some parts of the world, with the approval of two antiviral drugs, which were found to cut hospitalizations and deaths in clinical trials. So could antivirals be the next piece of the puzzle to help us to live with the SARS-CoV-2 virus? So you talk to, you're talking with an antiviral guy, so this is my, <laughs> my area. And these are Peter Anderson is a professor of pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Colorado. Just think of the impact that antivirals have had on other viral illnesses. I mean, they've changed HIV into a manageable you know, disease. Hepatitis C is curable. Hepatitis B is manageable. So these can be highly, highly efficacious medications. Um, that is direct acting antivirals. And so I'm excited. I think if we can use them early enough in the course of illness, I think they're going to have a, a big impact. Most antiviral drugs target specific viruses, others a broad spectrum covering a wide range. While most antibiotics destroy the target pathogen, antivirals inhibit its development. The first two new antivirals to be approved for use against COVID-19 are Monupiravir, developed by Merck, which reduced hospitalizations by 30% in trials, and Pfizer's drug Paxlovid, which achieved 89%. Professor Sei Koo leads Agile, a coronavirus drug initiative in the UK, which investigates new potential COVID-19 treatments. How might this change how we deal with the pandemic? People always think, is this a case of vaccines or antivirals? I think it's a case of the vaccines to prevent infection, and that's going to do the majority of heavy lifting uh, in this pandemic. And then at the other end of the scale, there's the uh, interventions to stop people from dying uh, who have severe disease. So uh, this is uh, things that you read about in the recovery trial, the use of steroids and other medications. But in between, there has been an area which is largely under-delivered until now. The licensing of a uh, uh, multipiravir heralds uh, an age of orally available drugs, which are going to get better and better and better uh, and much more potent at suppressing viral multiplication uh, and at preventing people from going into hospital. Professor Koo was involved in phases one and two of the Monupiravir trials. The drug targets an enzyme the virus uses to make copies, causing it to introduce errors into its genetic code. Eventually, so many errors are made, the virus can no longer survive. Lowering the viral load in this way reduces the severity of the disease. There were concerns Monupiravir and Paxlovid were authorised too quickly in the UK. I completely understand that. I, I think the UK regulator has taken the view that business cannot continue as normal during a pandemic. And so how do you make the same decisions you would make in, in peacetime during a pandemic that are quick and yet sufficiently robust? Uh, and the MHRA has taken a very pragmatic view. Different regulators will take different views. There were no safety concerns in the trials, which were also placebo controlled, which is the gold standard when it comes to evaluating efficacy and safety. But every country has its own regulators. For example, in the UK, there are protections in place, as Dr. Shuli Porkus, the Vice President of the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine in London, explains. Molnupiravir and Paxlovid have both uh, got to a point of something called conditional approval, which is when the regulators have looked at the, the information from the companies, so uh, including clinical trial information, and the regulators have said, um, yes, that we can see that the, the medicines uh, show that they work, that they um, have met the safety mm. standards, and that we're able to give this conditional approval. 
Once any medicine has any type of approval, it is continuously monitored for um, any new issues, any safety issues, to actually see how it works in the real world. Because the first trials of antivirals began shortly after COVID first arrived, they were tested almost totally on the unvaccinated. But in the UK, 71.5% of the population has had two vaccine doses and 54.5% have also had the booster top-up. So an Oxford University study called Panoramic will assess the impact of antivirals on vulnerable but vaccinated people in the UK. The companies also need to submit more information from trials as it becomes available and the regulators will keep looking at it and saying, OK, is the information we have on the medicine, is it up to date? Do we need to change it at all? Do we need to give different instructions on how the medicine should be used in clinical practice? There has been some talk about possible side effects from monuperavir that suggest it may cause mutations in human DNA. What do you say to that? So this is an area of quite a considerable amount of controversy at the moment. Um, and I think it's important to remember that no drug when it's licensed can ever be declared truly safe. I think that's really important. It's never happened in the history of drug development. You really only know that something's safe where uh, uh, years and years down the line with tens of thousands of people exposed to the drug. So all you can say is that a drug is sufficiently safe for deployment. And that bar has been met uh, as far as the MHRA are concerned, that, 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 that regulatory uh, uh, hurdle has been overcome. Now that's not to say that the drug is totally safe. And I think that we do need to worry. So the action, the mechanism of action for molnupiravir is one of creating uh, lethal mutagenesis. That is to say that it becomes incorporated into the viral genome and then forces the virus to mutate uh, to the point that the virus is no, it becomes extinct. Um, and because those mutations are, are catastrophic. The question then is, um, uh, does it do that to human uh, 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 DNA? Uh, and there are mixed uh, uh, results about that. The, the, the conventional tests that are applied to any drug uh, entering pharmaceutical evaluation uh, uh, suggest that it is, it is safe enough. Um, with the caveats that I've, I've said, but, but there are some novel tests that are not part of the usual assessment, the battery of assessments, which have cast some questions about its long-term safety. But I think in terms of risk, you're, you're giving a drug for actually quite a relatively short period of time uh, for, in some people, potentially quite severe illness. So I think it's always a case of balancing risks against uh, potential benefits. Molnupiravir is not recommended during pregnancy or when breastfeeding. There are also concerns over damage to sperm, so it's advised to wait three months once finished taking the antiviral before trying to conceive. Like Molnupiravir, Pfizer's Paxlovid also aims to stop the virus from replicating, but uses a slightly different method. While it's 89% effective in patients at risk, there are some safety issues. Uh, so it is actually two medications. Uh, one is uh, nermotrelvir, and then the other one is ritonavir. Nermotrelvir is the new antiviral against COVID, and ritonavir boosts its activity, preventing the breakdown of it in the body. But the concern is ritonavir may also affect other drugs the patient may be taking. Some of these interactions are not small and trivial. Some are very large. They cause very large increases in the other drugs. I'm talking about uh, antiarrhythmics, immunosuppressants, uh, some blood thinners. So those kinds of classes of drugs. Um, in some of those drugs, um, you cannot pair them. You cannot give them with ritonavir. Many tools are needed to combat COVID. Different therapies work on different parts of the virus, depending on what the patient needs and how sick they are. While many scientists would argue prevention is better than a cure, in places where there are low vaccination rates, antivirals could save lives. Do we know how effective these new antivirals are with the latest dominant variant Omicron? So far, the direct acting antivirals that we're talking about, Molnupiravir and, and Paxlovid, uh, appear to be active against uh, all the variants. Um, in Typically with the variants, the thing that's changing in the virus is the more of the spike protein. And that's the concern with, will vaccines retain their 
efficacy. So these drugs don't work that way. They work on different steps in the life cycle. There's been no reason for those um, or less reason for there to be mutations in those other steps that would cause resistance to the antivirals. But we still don't know when we'll see more antivirals approved for use. One that I've heard of recently is an oral version of remdesivir being developed. So remdesivir at the moment is intravenous. So um, something that can be taken uh, as a tablet or capsule will, will uh, potentially be helpful. There are also other treatments such as the neutralizing monoclonal antibodies that help provide passive immunities, so helping your immune system fight the virus. Um, and there are some of those uh, coming into use at the moment, um, but it's definitely an area to watch in terms of uh, new ones being approved for use potentially or potentially for a broader use. And also we're now working out where, how we best combine all the different things we have, whether it's from masks and ventilation or vaccines or boosters or treatments. We're now saying actually we've got lots of things to look at, lots more coming. Um, how do we best put them together in the right way um, across the world? There will be further research and trials done and questions asked about these antivirals. Will they affect transmission of the virus or prevent illness in people who've been exposed to it? Will they work against all variants in a real-world setting? And could the virus become resistant to antivirals? But there's also a very human question. Do you think we'll see the same hesitancy with antivirals as we did with the vaccines? That's a hard one because it's early days. Uh, uh, there are people uh, who might not want to receive vaccines and there are people for whom vaccines have less uh, uh, benefit, uh, so they have weakened immune systems and uh, uh, cancers and uh, uh, bone marrow transplants that, that prevent their immune system from mounting a sufficient, sufficiently robust response. So for those people, antivirals will be a safety net. Now, uh, 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 will we see hesitancy with antivirals? I, I don't know. I, I hope not. missing ingredient of many world-changing scientific innovations like fusion reactors and quantum computers, as well as our everyday energy systems, is room temperature superconductors. Pursued by scientists for decades, this elusive dream is finally becoming a reality. When an electric current flows through a regular conductor like copper, there is still some resistance, which means energy is lost through heat. With superconductors, the electrons flow freely with absolutely no resistance. In 1911, Dutch physicist Heike kameling onnes discovered that mercury becomes a superconductor when cooled to around absolute zero to minus 273 degrees Celsius. Since then, superconductivity has been achieved at less extreme but still very low temperatures, paving the way for applications like MRIs in hospitals. The theory is that when some materials become very cold, electrons form pairs, which allow charge to flow without resistance. Another method is pressure. Since the 1960s, scientists have known that highly pressurized hydrogen can superconduct at room temperature. In recent years, researchers have raced to achieve superconductivity at ever lower pressures and higher temperatures, with the aim of shifting this niche technology into the mainstream. In 2020, a team at the University of Rochester in the US struck gold, becoming the first to create a room temperature superconductor. A mixture of carbon and sulfur was milled down to tiny balls and compressed between two diamonds, while hydrogen gas was injected. The resulting compound was found to be a superconductor at temperatures as high as 15 degrees Celsius. The crystals were very small, 30 millionths of a meter across, and the pressure very high. The next stage is to scale up the materials and reduce the pressure required. This could revolutionize electric grids where billions of dollars worth of energy is wasted each year through transmission, also causing unnecessary greenhouse gas emissions. 
Superconductors used in areas like renewable energy storage and quantum computing would become cheaper, simpler and less likely to fail if extreme cooling was no longer required. Superconductors can also create powerful magnetic fields useful for all sorts of applications, even levitating trains. You can see more of Razor on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. as we know it, is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global business, only on CGTN. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. Time. It affects us all, even the symbol of time behind us, as you can see. But it's a question most of us have never even asked ourselves. What is time? Philosophers have been trying to answer that for centuries. What is time? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that, that, that is a question I think that's very hard to answer. Time seems to be one directional. We are floating with the time towards the future. You can have a lot of philosophical thoughts about it. I'm a sort of more like engineer kind of a person, a physicist. So we think about time more sort of around, it's a mechanism, what does that actually mean? I try to tell the time as best I can, and we continue to create new technologies. Making atomic clock is just a one small portion of human endeavors trying to understand this very complex concept of time. Dr. Jun Yi is based at the University of Boulder in Colorado and recently received the 2022 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for his pioneering research on atomic clocks. 
together with my students and postdocs in our lab, we have built one of the most precise atomic clocks in the world. So precise that it has a variation of less than one second in 15 billion years. That's the age of the universe. So we don't have enough time to understand the fundamental nature of time itself. But what about the way we measure it? What is a second? To answer that, we need a little bit of a history lesson. In 350 BCE, Greek philosopher Aristotle defined time as the calculable measure of motion with respect to before and afterness. In 1090, a Chinese civil servant named Su Shong built one of the first mechanical clocks powered by water. In the 1650s, astronomer Christian Huygens realized that a regulator was needed. He invented the first pendulum clock. This was improved in the 18th century by John Harrison, who realized that smaller, higher frequency oscillators made clocks more reliable. In 1927, Canadian-born Warren Marison pioneered use of a quartz crystal which vibrates when placed in an electric circuit. In the 1960s, scientists began to use atoms as oscillators, building atomic clocks based on the element cesium. We used to be taught that electrons orbit the nucleus of their atoms like planets orbit the sun. More probably, they occupy what are known as probability fields, also called orbitals, which come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. For each atom, there are several of these orbitals occupied by electrons in higher or lower energy states. When an electron moves from one orbital to another, that's known as a quantum jump. If the electron moves from a high energy orbital to one of lower energy, it gives off energy in the form of a photon or a particle of light. All this light is the way nature wants to communicate with us. Each atom you can think of as nothing but a light beacon. Uh, they get excited and they emit light. So light, in some sense, is our way that for our human beings to communicate with these microscopic world of atoms. So is it correct to say that the pendulum of your clock is an electron's relationship with its atom? Yes, that's right. It's all about electrons motion around the nucleus inside an atom, in our case, a strontium atom. We needed very, very stable lasers to be able to communicate with the atom, to find out that this, this orbital oscillations of electrons around the nucleus. And when we, when we build atomic clock, all we are doing is to making sure the laser frequency is matched with the electronic oscillations around the nucleus. So you not only had to find out that strontium was the correct atom, you also had to build incredibly precise lasers. That's exactly right. You know, that's what laser is. And you're tuned onto a particular transition of atom. It's like a, a particular station you just dialed in to communicate with the atom. You have to tune it such that you, you find their particular frequency of this atoms. Once they're in the excited state, you can say, well, how do I measure that atom? So you can use a different sets of lasers. You know, you have one laser to just tickling with the energy transitions of this particular clock. And then you can have other lasers to be helping you to find out whether the electrons are being now promoted to the excited state or still living in the ground state. So having them work in tandem allows you to figure out, well, where the electron is located uh, in terms of its orbital with respect to the nucleus. And in, if it's uh, located in the, in the ground state, how do I tune my clock laser frequency such that I can promote the electron to the excited state. And then you can see whether after a long period of time, whether the electron motion and the laser evolution is still in phase. If you if you they are, then you say, aha, my laser frequency is matched to the electron motion around the nucleus. Dr. Ye and his team have trapped hundreds of thousands of atoms in a vacuum chamber. By shining a finely tuned laser at these atoms, he's able to excite electrons to jump in a controlled way. 
Another laser measures the number of photons given off and over all the hundreds of thousands of atoms, he is able to measure how many times electrons jump on average every second. Older atomic clocks use cesium atoms, which oscillate at just over 9 billion cycles per second. But Dr. Yi's team is now using the element strontium, which has 50,000 more transitions per second than cesium. So your clock's more accurate than cesium because the fundamental properties of strontium mean that excitation happens more often, which means you can subdivide the second into finer and finer intervals. You got it. You, I mean, what you just said in the last sentence is the essence of the modern atomic clock. Yes, exactly. In a certain period of time, say a second, we just got a more pendulum swings, if I may use the word pendulum, it's a quantum pendulum. We got more swings, and therefore we can subdivide the second more finely, more precisely, and therefore our measurement accuracy and precision improves. This improvement promises to have huge applications in the real world. Imagine the clock being so good that you can actually test those fundamental theories at a better, better precision because we are building a standards that's connected to nature. As we dig deeper and deeper, being able to measure things better and better or define the time with a more and more a better precision and accuracy, I will be able to measure how the glacier is melting, how the groundwater is moving around, the ocean level is changing, how the gravity is changing on Earth due to the environmental change. That should be connected to the time because time and space is in one if you could actually measure them very accurately. So you can see there's always two sides of the same coin, fundamental science and application that will benefit the society. As well as monitoring for weather changes, the atomic clock could also be applied to tracking systems such as GPS or self-driving cars. But that's not all. I'm not sure how far down this path you are, but you've postulated that if you can get a clock accurate enough, you might be able to detect particles of dark matter. It, it theoretically makes up most of the stuff in the universe, but it so far has completely eluded our own uh, detection on Earth. We know that, for example, stars are moving way too fast at the edge of the galaxy, and by ordinary gravity, it should not have been. So how could that be? There must be something invisible that's holding the galaxy together. So one of the theories proposed, the dark matter is ultra light, and it's just have lots, lots of massive uh, numbers of particles around that. But you have so many of them, they can create the halo along your, around your uh, galaxy. Physicists have postulated that they were coupled to electromagnetic fields. This is where the expertise of Professor Yi's team comes in. Amazingly, they can actually measure the effect electromagnetic fields have on time. The dependence of how the electrons are moving around the nucleus could be influenced by the fact dark matter is changing some of the fundamental constants that we think governs the universe. And so if we can measure between different atomic clocks and suddenly you, we find, well, some of the atoms are telling you the time in a different rate. And if the, you, you rule out everything else and you find out, well, the rates of these two clocks are still different. Uh, and the, the difference can be attributed to something which is varying in time, like fundamental constants. Then you have a clue that maybe the dark matter is, uh, is modulating that our ordinary matter in the field through the signatures of the clocks. And so this is the one area that we think as we continue to improve the clock measurement sensitivity, maybe one day we will actually discover dark matter by just making our sensitivity better and better and better. Does that make sense? <laughs> it absolutely did make sense, which is really amazing me, because when I started researching this and I looked at some of your talks, I was like, oh, I don't want to inter interview this man. I don't understand. But I feel like I do now. So that's a great accomplishment on your part. Thank you so much. <laughs>